Hi, my name is Ellie Patak Montgomery, and I'm the medical advocate for Sheriff Tom Dart and Department of Corrections. You're about to see a video regarding H1N1 and the seasonal flu. Hopefully this video will address all your questions and concerns regarding the flu. Thank you so much. We took a, um, a list of the most common questions that we've received and put them, in a, put them in order, and we'd like to try to address these for you at this time, and hopefully this will answer most or all of your questions and concerns about flu season that's coming that's here now, actually. Uh, the first question that we receive is, what is the difference between seasonal flu and H1N1, or the swine flu? Well, there's a couple parts to that question. Uh, first is, as far as the viruses go, seasonal flu is, of course, the same flu that we get every year, usually happens, uh, starts around December and peaks in late January, early February. This is the same flu we see year after year after year. It's, it's often a different strain, but the same general concept applies. Swine flu, or H1N1 flu, is, a, a, it is also an influenza virus. But what's different about this is it originated uh, in, in pigs, presumably in Mexico. It acquired a, uh, a gene which allowed it to jump species from pigs to humans, and then it was capable of being transmitted from person to person. As far as the illness goes, there's very little difference between how, so how sick someone gets from seasonal flu and how sick someone gets from H1N1 or swine flu. So far, based on what we've seen in the springtime, it actually looks like the swine flu may be a milder illness than what we actually see with the seasonal influenza. Oh, next question is, how do we treat the flu? Well, uh, again, we're talking about two different flu viruses, and so there's two different mechanisms for treatment. Um, well, first let's talk about swine flu, or H1N1. This is generally uh, going to be treated with a drug called Tamiflu. Most of you have heard about this on the news. Um, the, the medication is, for treatment is if you report to uh, a medical provider within 48 hours of your symptom onset, no longer than that, but within 48 hours, and you are prescribed this medication, it doesn't cure the disease or, or anything like that. All it does is shorten the duration that you may experience the symptoms. So on average, people are going to feel sick for you know eight to ten days if they don't take any medication. We're talking about shortening the duration by maybe two or three days. Um, there are issues with treatment uh, for the swine flu, and the CDC has now recommended that we do not treat swine flu with Tamiflu unless you have a very severe illness that actually requires hospitalization. So you, so you come down with symptoms, you, you have a fever and a cough, and you think maybe you have the swine flu, you go to your doctor, more than likely your doctor is not going to prescribe you Tamiflu because the CDC has recommended that we uh, reserve the medication not only for supply reasons, but also to limit the possibility of the virus developing resistance. As far as the seasonal flu goes, there are several medications which are effective against seasonal flu. Same general principles apply, which is 48 hours or less after your symptom onset, you may be a candidate for treatment. There are drugs like romantidine or amantadine, and then of course there's Tamiflu and Relenza. Part of the decision about which of these medications you may be prescribed will depend on what type of seasonal flu is circulating. I won't go into the nuances, but basically there's two major types of seasonal flu, type A and type B. Some of these medications have activity against A, some of them have activity against B, some have activity against both. Now we're going to get to the vaccine questions. Um, probably the most common one is, you know, should I get the vaccine? Um, and both, we're talking about both the seasonal flu vaccine and the swine flu vaccine if and when it becomes available. Uh, the, the general answer to this question is yes, but let me be a little more specific. The CDC has published criteria which uh, recommends the vaccine be given to people who are at the highest risk of developing complications from having the flu. When I say complications, I mean not just feeling crappy and missing work. I'm talking about developing a, a serious pneumonia, um, serious respiratory compromise, and, and, and potentially death. Remember that every year, seasonal flu kills over 30,000 Americans. We never get freaked out or alarmed about this, but we're talking about 30,000 people getting killed every year, and yet all you talk about is, all we hear about is swine flu. So I'm going to list for you the general criteria for who is at the highest risk of developing complications. These are the people who should get the vaccine. First is uh, people over the age of 65. Next is people who have a history of cardiopulmonary disease, so heart and lung diseases, things like COPD or emphysema, chronic asthmatics, people with heart failure, uh, sickle cell patients, and dialysis patients. 
The third category are what we call immunocompromised patients. This, of course, includes things like HIV slash AIDS, but also patients who are on chronic, things like chronic steroids, which are immunosuppressive drugs, transplant patients, and so on. The next category are people who have conditions that may compromise respiratory function or increase the risk of aspiration, which is accidental swallowing of secretions uh, into the lung cavity. These are people who have like seizure disorders, uh, people with spinal cord injuries, and, uh, neuromuscular disorders like Parkinson's disease. Those are also people we would recommend get the vaccine. And then lastly, women who are going to be in the second or third trimester of pregnancy during flu season should also receive the vaccine. Now those are the CDC criteria for, for people who should get the vaccine. We think it's good policy and good protocol that everybody consider getting this vaccine. These are the people who are the highest risk, but who wants to get sick and miss work and use up their sick time? Oh, don't answer that. <laughs> the second part of this question is about H1N1 flu. Uh, the CDC has not formally published its official guidelines on who should receive the H1N1 vaccine. We anticipate it's going to be more or less the same general criteria and then they may add a second group, which will be um, the very young, particularly children under the age of 10. There seems to be something about H1N1 that has uh, uh, worse, worse outcomes in the very young. One of the ways that flu is spread from person to person, generally it's spread through, respir through respiratory droplets. Uh, you've heard of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is spread through, uh, respiratory, through the respiratory tract as well. The difference between TB and the flu is that the droplets are larger, so it's called a droplet transmission, meaning that if you're three feet or more from the person, you're fairly safe, and that's why we uh, reinforce certain things as covering your cough when you cough, you know, making sure that you cough into your sleeve. Um, and that's why, it's, even though it's more readily spread through person-to-person um, -person contact and, rest in the, and through the air, it can be, um, spread from inanimate objects too. Say if I sneezed on the table and you put your hand on the table and then you put your hand to your face, the eyes, the mucous membranes are a very efficient way to spread it. But I wouldn't worry so much about contact isolation as I would just breathing the same air and being in close contact within three feet of someone who has the symptoms. Okay, if, I, if I'm exposed to someone who has flu, how long would it take before I know if I have it? A person can generally transmit the virus is most infectious from the day before they actually get symptoms to about the third day into the symptoms. And it can be spread up until seven days after symptoms. So within that period of time, generally from three to seven days after you've been exposed, you may come down with symptoms. Does the flu live on things like doorknobs and handcuffs? If so, for how long? And it can, the virus can live on inanimate objects for a few hours. Um, again, um, that's why we stress hand washing, because if you wash your hands, you don't have to worry about the doorknobs, right? <laughs> and um, those little wipes, like you could buy at Walgreens again, the little Clorox wipes, or, or any type of tuberculocidal, uh, germicidal uh, product will kill the flu virus on inanimate objects like your handcuffs. Uh, if you have these symptoms, what should you do? Number one is you should call your supervisor and they will advise you as to whether or not you should even report for duties. Part of our responsibility as um, representatives of public health, and you all are representatives of public health, is not only to keep yourselves healthy but to protect our population inside and outside of the jail. So be responsible, monitor your symptoms, and report them to your supervisor if you think you're coming down with the flu. And as I was talking about personal protective equipment, one thing that I urge you to do um, is to have a thermometer in your home this year. If you don't know how to read a thermometer, get one of the electronic thermometers or use the temper dots. Does alcohol gel work as good as hand washing? There are some studies that suggest that alcohol gel actually works better than hand washing. So yeah, you're very, very safe with this. And again, hand washing is only as good as how well you wash your hands and for the period of time you wash your hands and the friction you use when you're washing your hands. But this is just as good, if not better, than soap and water. There's some really good websites. The Cook County Department of Public Health has a good website with all of this that will reinforce everything we're talking about today. Also, cdc.gov mm -hmm. is another excellent resource for, for flu information. We hope that you enjoyed the film and that this information was helpful for you. Please follow up with the website and the numbers that have been provided to you. Thank you so much.